Welcome to Trench Diaries. This is Battleship Bismarck, part 7. Over Christmas, we were given leave. For most of us, this was our last chance to be with our families. Those who could not get away were able to spend a few more hours in hospitable Hamburg. I enjoyed two weeks of marvelous skiing in the Bavarian mountains. On January the 24th, 1941, the finishing touches to our ship were completed. But we could not immediately return to the Baltic to continue our trials and battle practice, as we had intended to do. A sunken ore ship was blocking the Kiel Canal and the thick ice that had formed during this exceptionally severe winter was delaying salvage work. The idea of us making the long detour around Jutland was rejected by Berlin. I used the prolonged stay in Hamburg to take a special course in the English language in the fields of law and economics in which I had a long-standing interest. I had the great luck to find a teacher who could look back on many years residence in the British Commonwealth and possessed a truly sovereign knowledge of English. Moreover, we understood one another politically from the start. When I asked him how the newly fashionable Nazi buzzword Gleichschalten could best be translated, he scornfully offered to boil down to the same level. And the down in this formulation had at once indicated that we saw things the same way. In the Hamburg branch of the Reich Federation of Interpreting Organizations, through which, on his advice, I took a translator and interpreter's examination, he had long been on the blacklist on account of his political opinions, and one day one of the Federation's functionaries warned me against being around him too much. If only you knew, I thought. I also had great luck during these months through a social connection with an outstanding Hamburg hostess, who maintained an international circle even in wartime. When one was with her, let her be mended with gratitude here, it was balm to be able once more to talk reasonably and easily about God and the world, secure against eavesdropping and so wonderfully far from all the cramping of conversation in so-called national circles. It happened that I had received an invitation to one of her gatherings scheduled for the time Hitler was to give his speech of January the 30th, 1941, and I fully resolved to accept it and for once to escape Hitler's tirade, his baying into the ether, as I always called it. But unfortunately a strict order came from the first officer for us to assemble around the loudspeaker in the officer's mess for Hitler's speech, and it seemed to me better to avoid the complications in the offing for an unexcused absence. The speech was broadcast from the Berlin Sports Palace and on account of its length I took in only those points for which over the years I had developed a special sensitivity. After the usual retrospective of the desperate situation of the Reich eight years earlier, Hitler launched the first attack on the nature of the English as unsocial, born capitalists and reactionaries to whose account the outbreak of the First World War also should be debited. Yet, for Germany, the year 1918 had been exclusively the result of an exceptional accumulation of personal incompetence in the leadership of our people, which would never be repeated. He himself had drawn up his foreign policy program at an early date. He said, the destruction of Versailles. He had not been able to make it clear to a certain Jewish internationalist capitalist clique that 85 million Germans were indeed a world power. National Socialism would determine the next millennium of German history, the last part of 1939 and 1940 had already practically decided the war. If our enemies were pinning their hopes on America, well, he had also taken that possibility into his calculations. And if they should have other hopes, let's say that Italy would desert the Axis, well, these gentlemen should not invent a revolution in Milan, but should rather take care that none break out among themselves. The Duce and he were neither Jews nor businessmen, and when they gave each other their hands, it was the handshake of men of honor. And if the enemy was hoping that the German people would be weakened by hunger, the four-year plan had taken care of that too. These German people would go through thick and thin with him, and the German spirit of fanatical readiness would enable them to pay back every blow they received with interest and compound interest. Thus, we were going into the new year with the best equipped Wehrmacht in German history. At sea the U-boat war would begin this spring and there too the enemy would see that we had not been sleeping. 
He said, The year 1941 will be, of this I am convinced, the historical year of a great new order in Europe and will contribute to securing the reconciliation among peoples and I may not forget my earlier indication that if the world were to be plunged into a general war by Jewry, all Jewry will have played out its role in Europe. The coming months and years will show that here, too, I have been right. The promise of a new order in Europe was becoming increasingly common in speech and print and there were no longer any bounds on the fantasy and the megalomania. The threat of the obliteration of the entire Jewish population hung more darkly than ever over Europe. Because of the blocking of the North Sea Canal our sailing date was set for February the 5th and until then we conducted training and battle drills in Hamburg Harbor. When that day came, the canal had still not been cleared, but we could not have left anyway because some of our pressure gauges and electrical lines to the boiler room ventilators had been damaged by the extreme cold and we were not ready for sea. Although the situation was remedied by February the 16th, the canal remained blocked and our departure had to be postponed again, this time to March the 5th. At the end of February, Lindemann complained in the war diary, the ship has been detained in Hamburg since January the 24th. Five weeks of training time at sea have been lost. On March the 6th we cast off from the wharf at the Blomenfoss yard, steamed out into the Elbe and once again headed downstream. As the familiar silhouette of Hamburg slowly sank astern, I had the feeling that this time our absence from the beautiful Hanseatic city would be longer. For part of the way, the admiral accommodating the Hamburg naval headquarters did us the honor of escorting us in his flagship. Scattered passers-by waved from the banks of the river and at midday we dropped anchor at Brunsbüttel Roads. Three fighters flew air cover for us and an icebreaker and two Sperrbrecher anchored nearby to protect us against possible aerial torpedo attacks. We entered the canal the next day and on the 8th reached Kiel where we spent a few days in Scherhafen again aligning our batteries. Also, we had to take aboard ammunition, two of our four assigned aircraft, provisions, fuel and water. Leaving Kiel, we continued our voyage east. Because of the thick ice in the western Baltic, the pre-dreadnought Schlesien, a veteran of the Imperial Navy, went ahead of us to act as an icebreaker. Behind her came Sperrbrecher 36, then the Bismarck. On the afternoon of March the 17th, we once again dropped anchor at Gotenhafen, which was to be our principal base until we sailed on our first operational cruise. The following days saw a great deal of activity. We conducted more high-speed trials and endurance runs and tried out our hydrophone gear. This apparatus emitted a sound impulse by whose echo the range, bearing, nature and conduct of its contact could be determined. A well-trained listener could even identify the type of vessel the echo came from. I still remember the report from the Prince Eugene, our companion on our Atlantic sortie, on May the 24th, 1941, before the Battle of Iceland. It was made by Leutnant zur See Karl Otto Flint, a technically proficient and talented listening officer. He was sitting at the hydrophones when at around 0440 he picked up turbine noise and reported to the ship's bridge, noise of two fast moving turbine ships at 280 degrees relative bearing. The ships proved to be the Hood and the Prince of Wales. The most important thing now was intensive training of our batteries. Practice firing for the instruction of the fire control officers and gun crews alternated with carrying out projects for the Gunnery Research Command for ships, an organization that ran its own trials on new ships with a view to improving the ordnance of various ship types. For me as Gunnery Officer, these tests were exciting, but for the crew they just meant drill after drill after drill. Battle practice in daytime, battle practice at night, but the men did not complain, however they were in the swing of things and were becoming more and more anxious for our first operation at sea to get underway. On March 19th, Lindemann learned from the captain of our younger sister ship, the Turpitz, that, according to a directive issued by the Seekriegsleitung, the Bismarck was to be ready for her first mission from three to four weeks earlier than originally intended. Now she was to be ready at the end of April. This meant that Lindemann had to cut short the program of the Gunnery Research Command for ships. He arranged for it to end on April the 2nd, after which time we conducted our own surface and anti-aircraft firing practices. We also spent more time than before in clear for action drills and in training our air crews. Since the Prince Eugene, which was commissioned three weeks earlier than Bismarck, was to be our escort on the upcoming operation in the Atlantic, we conducted tactical exercises with her. We also exercised with the 25th U-boat flotilla and, with the help of the tanker Bromberg, we practiced refueling at sea. 
It was at this time that we started doing searchlight drills. We carried seven searchlights, one was on the forward edge of the tower mast, two were atop the main hangar and the other four were high up on either side of the stack. They were directed to their target through the use of large high-powered binoculars mounted in posts on the sides of the forward battle command station. The purpose of these drills was to provide practice at picking up an indicated object at first try and keeping the light on it. Besides the frozen lines to the boiler room ventilators mentioned earlier, we were having a few other problems with the propulsion plant. Some hairline cracks in superheaters, a broken ball bearing ring on the middle main coupling, a loose sleeve in one of the main steam lines, salt in one of the turbines. All these insignificant defects in the plant were repaired in short order, but in the war diary Lindemann complained that they tended to tarnish the good impression previously gained on its reliability. When Naval Group Command North, to which the ship was subordinate, read his comment in the middle of April, it added, Considering that this is new construction, the engine malfunctions were very minor. In fact, the propulsion plant has been running more smoothly than expected. Lindemann must have felt increasingly impatient to be able to report to the Seekriegsleitung that his ship was ready for operational deployment. Over Easter, which fell on April the 13th this year, the Bismarck went into Gotenhafen for four days. There, we were to take on more ammunition and have some work done to our engines. When we were at sea, the routine was still battle practice, more battle practice and battle problems. In a battle problem, a particular tactical situation was assumed. We were, for example, covering an attack by the Prince Eugen on a British convoy that was escorted by a battleship. We went into action with the battleship, in the course of which we received two hits. The damage done to Bismarck would be presented as realistically as possible. Electrical breakdowns by removing fuses, fires by using some bombs, gaseous fumes by using tear gas and so forth. In the case of damage that could not be portrayed, damage notices would be posted in the relevant parts of the ship. For example, to the commander of the port second 15 cm turret. Turret destroyed by a direct hit. Your gun crew has been wiped out. The turret commander and his men would then cease to take part. In partially destroyed compartments there was feverish activity. Fire hoses were hooked up, openings were sealed tight, alternate piping routes established and all damage was brought under control. Obermachinist Oskar Barho of the main electrical control station enjoyed the breakdowns and kept calm in the face of them. He gave precise instructions and repeatedly told his men, If I become a casualty, you must keep everything going exactly the same way, regardless of your grade. If you think one of my orders is incorrect, report it. The officers told their men again and again, if only two or three are still alive at your station, carry on. That's right, carry on. Execute the required emergency procedures at once. This could be somewhat difficult for a young seaman or stoker who received a damage notice and had to decide how to deal with it himself. He would then have to give orders, which previously had been done by officers, and how often did they practice this. Superiors intervened only when lack of experience led the men into making serious mistakes. Not a bad way to accustom a young man of thinking and acting on his own. Or another battle problem, which machine and gust Josef Stutz would never be able to get out of his mind. He was ordered on board on April 1941 and assigned for duty to Stab's Obermachinist Gerhard Sagner, whose specialty was indicated by his title of Pumpenmeister, Pump Master. Sagner had welcomed Stutz, a draughtsman trained in skyscraper and bridge construction, with the words, You are just the man for me and carefully acquainted him with his duties. Staats was happy with this transfer to the Bismarck and with the personal style of his immediate supervisors, his division officer, Oberleutnant Karl Ludwig Richter, the second damage control officer and Pumpenmeister Sangner. He also hit it lucky with his mess, its members were all old hands. Of the five machinist seamen, four had already been sunk once in the cruiser Karlsruhe. Among them he had become especially close to Erich Seifert, generally known as Fietje. And Fietje enjoyed telling him repeatedly and forcefully of his experiences in the Karlsruhe. He said, If anything like that ever happens with Bismarck, keep all your things on, especially your leather clothing and your money in your pocket. At the time, he had neglected to do either. But now to the battle problem. The most important Stutz would, exp the most important one Stutz would experience during his training period on Bismarck. As the damage control center runner, he had to carry a message to turret Bruno, to which command of the ship had been transferred upon the hypothetical destruction of the forward conning tower. Stutz encountered the captain there and tried to make the report to him, but Lindemann did not react at all. Don't you see? Someone shouted at him. The captain's dead! 
Stats replied, but the captain's standing right here. And at the same time he looked at Lindemann, who, despite every outward sign of indifference, showed a sly smile. Well, Slim, are you from Cologne? He heard in the same voice as before from Oberleutnant zur See Friedrich Kardinal, a Rhinelander like Stadz. Then Kardinal said, Give me the message and come to the bridge. And the two of them had stood on it, no one else, for all the others in the area had supposedly become casualties. Kardinal explained, All the men who are pretending to be casualties put their caps on sideways, so they can be recognized most quickly. You must take notice of that. They could not know, Stetz and Cardinal, that a month later this sort of battle problem, complete down to the details, would overtake them in reality. After a battle problem, there would be a muster on the quarterdeck. Under the leadership of the captain, the damage done and the countermeasures taken were discussed in detail. Lindemann understood how to ask the right questions. Not only was he thoroughly conversant with the duties of naval officers and with his own specialty, naval ordnance, but he had a good understanding of technical matters. When the engines were the subject of discussion, he was quick to expose excuses for mistakes and attempts to gloss them over. Being a competent judge of these things, he would close the muster by distributing praise and censure. But his tone was always objective. The point of it all was that every man should learn and should have his confidence in himself and his ship built up. When we made a mistake, said Maschinengefreiter Budich, we did not hear angry words from our superiors. From time to time the ship went into Gotenhafen roads to catch her breath. When the sky was clear and a gentle wind blew over the ship, we experienced some truly enchanting nights there. Once, when the full moon drew a broad silver track across the Murakam water, Matrose Paul Hillen was on watch on the upper deck. Seeing the captain coming towards him, he prepared to make his report, but Lindemann waved it aside and said, Isn't that a wonderful sight? Many people would give a great deal of money to see it, and we have it for free. Later, Hillen, who had only recently come aboard, said, It was the first time I heard, not an order, but a personal remark from a high-ranking officer. Yes, Lindemann had a winning way, which inspired affection. Many of the ship's survivors have testified eloquently to that. One of them put it this way. We admired, indeed we loved, our commanding officer, Kapitän Zosé Lindemann. He was like a father to us. He always had an open ear for the cares and needs of his crew. One day, after being at sea a long time, we dropped anchor and the signal was piped, Work details to the fossil. That could mean only that the mailboat was coming out from Gotenhafen, and there it was already quite close. Suddenly it was too close and we heard a crash. Commanded the chief boatswain, shit, no mail. Sadly he watched over the stern post as the boat already taking on water dangerously and its longed for cargo returned stern first to Gotenhafen. Lindemann's entry in the war diary for the month of April was in sum, all our time was taken up in training. Heavy emphasis was placed on how the crew would perform in the upcoming operation. The men seemed to have come to recognize for the first time the magnitude of our mission, which they still don't know, but easily guess. He was right. Rumors were rife that we were about to depart on a mission. Watchwords surfaced, were whispered from man to man, then disappeared to make room for new ones. Turpitz appeared in the Gulf of Danzig for her own working up exercises and that provoked speculation that we were about to form a task force with her. And with this assumption we shall take a break. In the next episode the orders will come down for Bismarck's famous mission and we will get to the juicy details. Interesting things in this episode, um, for once it is mentioned that High Command would thoroughly read and actively comment on Lindemann's war diary. We've seen this with the U-boats in the Iron Coffin series, where various remarks were added to the war diaries of the boats after their patrols. Also of note is the cruiser Karlsruhe, whose sinking was mentioned briefly. The wreck of Karlsruhe was discovered only in 2017 off the coast of Norway, lying at a depth of nearly 500 meters or 1,600 feet. I will put the sonar image on screen for you. Karlsruhe was hit by a single torpedo amidships, which killed 13 of her crew and disabled many systems. Uh, she was abandoned shortly after and her captain was heavily criticized for this since Karlsruhe stayed afloat for two more hours after being abandoned and sunk only after being hit by two additional torpedoes. Her captain, Kapitän zur See Rive, survived the war and until his death lived in a very small village, not very far from where I currently live actually. Um, it's a small world after all. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this episode and I will see you next time. Cheers.